Hi there, everyone. My name is Michael Horwitz, Coder Z Marketing Manager. I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar, Closing the Gender Gap in STEM Education. Our speaker today will be Kim Kalogian. Kim is a STEM teacher at Robbins Elementary in Moore County, North Carolina. She has been an educator for 27 years as a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade classroom teacher. She was awarded a North Carolina State Keenan Fellowship to create multi-user immersive science game for elementary students. For those of you who are attending one of our STEM webinars for the first time, allow me to tell you a bit more about CoderZ. CoderZ is an online learning environment that allows students worldwide to program 3D virtual robots both in the classroom and in the CRCC, Cyber Robotics Coding Competition. CoderZ makes learning STEM with robotics accessible, affordable, and enjoyable for all, and it is fully compatible with the LEGO Mindstorms EV3. You can learn more about CoderZ by visiting gocoderz.com or by following CoderZ on Facebook and Twitter. A few technicalities before we begin. We will be recording this session and we'll share it with you and the other registrants. We welcome your questions. To submit a question, simply type it in the question box in the lower corner of the GoToWebinar control panel or tweet it using the hashtag seminars. Kim will answer your questions at the end of the session. Okay, let's get this webinar started. Kim, the audience is all yours. Thank you, Michael. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, it's wonderful to join you from uh, Robbins, North Carolina. Um, as Michael said, I've been an educator for now 20, this will be my 28th year, and I've always had a passion for science and robotics and engineering. And so I am very lucky to have the job that I have at Robbins Elementary, and I wanted to um, share a little bit about what we're doing here in our school and share how Coder Z has helped us to um, close the gender gap for a uh, girls coding club that we started here. Um, I know our friends at Coder Z are going to share my slides with you. Uh, later on, but I do have the bit.ly that's on the title slide and a lot of the slides are interactive for when you have time later to view them. So feel free to um, look at the ideas that, that I'm sharing with you today um, when you have some time. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our school. This is Robbins Elementary, again, in, in the middle of North Carolina in the United States of America. And we have about 430 students this year. And I wanted to give you a little bit of knowledge about the demographics of our students. We have 88% free and reduced lunch. So a lot of our students come from homes um, that do not have a lot of um, things that other students around the country have. And so we have a kind of unique population and we're working very hard to um, help our students overcome those difficulties and see some new outcomes for them for their future. 55% of our students are English language learners. Uh, most of them come from Spanish speaking families. And so um, we have a wonderful population here at Robbins. And we decided after reading a lot of research um, that we really wanted to move our school and our whole system um, in the direction of including more STEM, engineering, robotics opportunities for our students. And why we decided to do that was as we were reading the research, as I'm sure many of you have, um, STEM occupations are going to be um, much more available for us in the future. They're growing at a much faster rate than other occupations. And so we want our students to be prepared at an early age to be thinking about those careers in STEM. Um, it creates critical thinkers and, and meets a lot of the other four C's needs that we have been looking at. We want our students to increase their science literacy. We want them to um, be the innovators of, the, of um, the next generation. And so STEM is really helping us bridge that gap and, and meet those needs and use our four C's across all of our grade levels. Um, another reason that we really wanted to go in the direction of STEM is that we want our students to um, have a leg up and be prepared for the careers um, that are going to be open to them. We don't want um, you know, their socioeconomic status to stand in the way. We want them to have the opportunities um, that other students from around the world will have. Um, and a lot of our students only get that here at school. Their families aren't able to take them to museums and to other places where they might experience some STEM opportunities or hear about STEM careers. And so it's our job, we feel, at our schools to provide that for our students. 
Um, another reason that we really wanted to go with um, focusing on STEM is that it is, it is really helping us to bridge the ethnic and gender gaps um, that are sometimes found in math and science fields. Um, as we all know, especially with what's going on in the world right now, there are still a lot of gender bias and racial and ethnic bias um, that occurs. And so our STEM program is really helping us meet the needs of our students um, to overcome those biases and to learn new ways um, to to work with each other in the world. Um, just a side note, um, because we have so many Spanish speaking students, we had a little girl that had just moved from Mexico come into um, our school. And that very first day that she had joined our school, she came into the STEM lab speaking no English, but we happened to be doing some Lego robotics. And so, um, she jumped right in with the group and she was putting together Lego robots and she was coding and you would never know that she did not know a word of English. So these programs are really helping us to bridge that gap and to meet all of our students' needs. I wanted to take you on just a short little tour of our computer lab, um, what used to be a computer lab and is now a STEM lab. I'm sure many of you have seen these if you have older schools. On the countertops, um, there were um, lots of desktop, dusty old computers that were really not used for much of anything except test taking. Um, and so we started to tear those countertops out and we started to repurpose our lab. Um, at first we brought in folding tables. This was about um, a year and a half ago. And we repurposed one of our countertops to be um, along the wall as a workstation. And we um, then started to add other things to our lab. We started to um, write grants to get um, greens, a green screen. We put in some carpeting. Um, we have uh, purchased some, you see the little tent in the background that looks like a rocket. We are the Robbins Rockets. And so it is a rocket ship that we use for recording. Um, recording studios for our students. A lot of our students feel uncomfortable recording um, maybe videos or using Flipgrid in front of other students, so they use the Rockets as recording studios. Um, and you'll see on the right-hand side, we do have a green screen, and we had started using just whatever tables we could find around the school um, rather than the folding tables. And then this year, um, we used a lot of grant money to purchase brand new, the new white tables, which is in the picture at the bottom, and stools that are much more easily um, stackable. And so this is what our lab looks like today. In addition, we've used a lot of grant money and Title I funding to um, order a lot of supplies for our lab, a lot of robotics, um, a lot of, uh, we've, we ordered six or seven Dash robots through Wonder Workshop. We ordered a lot of We Do kits, the We Do 2.0s um, that we use for our building. Uh, we ordered 12 Sphero robots that we use. Um, we have Makey Makey and Little Bits circuit kits that we use um, in a lot of our coding and programming. And we also spent some money just on hands-on STEM that did not involve any technology. So we have kits of just plain Legos, we have Lincoln Logs, we have Play-Doh, all kinds of things for the students to get involved with engineering and building and STEM-related concepts that might not necessarily have to do with technology. We uh, wrote a large grant um, because at our school with our students coming from Spanish speaking backgrounds and just learning the English language, literacy is a big component of everything we do at our school. And so we wanted to integrate um, literacy into our program. And so we wrote a grant to get over seven, uh, 50 STEM related picture books that go along with a lot of our units. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we incorporate those into our program in a minute. Um, on the right-hand side, we also um, wrote another big grant to get things like hex bugs, which are tiny little robots um, that, are, that just have a little on and off switch, and so the kids do engineering with hex bugs. Um, we bought Kiva planks, which are wonderful, just um, regular shaped, rectangles shaped pieces of wood that they do a lot of engineering with. Copper tape, LED lights, pipe cleaners, magnets, all kinds of things um, that we needed to get our STEM program off the ground. Our newest additions that we're really excited about are um, we 
bought six Parrot Airborne Mambo drones. And so we are doing a drone program with our students. We started it um, a year and a half ago. One of my colleagues who may be in on this webinar, Carrie, uh, she started a drone program at her school and um, we decided to bring it over to the elementary school as well. And so students as young as third grade last year were learning how to program drones and carry out missions. These are indoor drones, so we use them right here in the STEM lab. We also have, our, we were lucky enough to get a cart of virtual reality headsets and Samsung phones. And so we do a lot of virtual reality with our students as well as augmented reality. We bought some sets of Osmo um, and Snap Circuits um, just to continue doing lessons at, at all different age levels. Um, this is uh, the website that I created for our STEM lab. And feel free to explore it on your own time. The link uh, is live um, when you're in the slides. You can check out all the engineering adventures that we do every week. There's lots of pictures, picture galleries, um, the calendar of what's coming up in our STEM lab. So feel free to check out our website. Right now, I'd like to show you just a short video of um, that will get, kind of give you a taste of what we do in the STEM lab. This was used as a promotional video um, last year. Our county has um, a very large engineering component, a robotics component, where we have annual um, elementary and middle school and high school robotics competitions. And so it was really important for us, and, and one of the reasons that I really was interested in Coder Z and got involved with Coder Z is that one of our competitions involves the Mindstorm Lego um, AV3 robots. And so Coder Z, since it works so well with those, um, you know, fit really nicely uh, with the program that we already have going on in our county. So I want to show you just a little promotional video that we used last year because it will give you a better idea of what we're doing um, in, in our STEM lab. So let me just share that video. Humpty Dumpty up on top if I had a bunch of them here as a wall? Yeah. Okay, so what we're gonna do is you guys something. are gonna engineer a safe wall for Humpty Dumpty to sit on top of. So in the STEM lab, we focus especially on the engineering process. And so the kids are constantly um, asking a question. Is there a problem in the world? Is there a problem in a literature picture book that we've just read? What is a problem that we can solve? And then they work on imagining a solution to that. They work on brainstorming and planning um, and drawing out plans just like a real engineer would. Um, and then they usually build whatever they think will help solve the problem. They test their build and then just like real engineers, you know, they revamp their um, their build and and come up with a solution. So we was thinking over there we ran out of wood, so now we're getting it out of Lego so of the size of the wood. So we can put them together and then make it taller and taller. I think we have seen tremendous growth in, in the words that they're using as far as the engineering process and as far as their learning goes, the whole metacognition, them thinking about their own thinking um, and developing those skills, um, STEM has really helped that. Put them up on top of your wall and see if you can stay. Oh, goodness. I think it's definitely teaching them that um, we learn through failure, and a lot of the students will tell you that, that a lot of times um, when something doesn't go right the very first time, they learn more because of the failure. And so they learn that growth mindset, that it's okay if I fail, I don't need to get upset about it, I just need to learn what went wrong and correct that the next time around. And that's where the whole engineering process comes in. Blow wind. Uh-oh. What do we need to do now? Make it stronger. And you see their face light up and have this, like, I can do this. It's just a really powerful you know, moment. And so they're learning how to be teammates. And so that's very important um, as they grow up, you know, being able to work with one another. Uh, collaboration, perseverance is probably the biggest thing because we don't stop with like, oh, you got it wrong. You're just gonna stop there and we're gonna move on. No, you're gonna solve it. Okay, what did you do? How can you do it differently to be successful? Good job. We are constantly amazed at what students can do. If you give them the opportunity, if you give them to the chance to do things that um, you just think are beyond their capabilities, they always rise to the occasion and often go beyond. We're trying to program a robot to get it to go all the way around the cycle. 
So go ahead and run. They come in here and we work on, you can see the, the boards that they have or the courses that they have. We have various boards and courses that they use um, for different skills. We learn teamwork, leadership, and um, we learn how to be an engineer better. It's easy, easy and hard and fun at the same time. You just get to have fun, but still be learning and still be getting education. expect when I walked in and when everything was set up we're like all right this is gonna be great and then everyone comes in we're like wow like it's just oh my gosh and you, it's just this energy you can't really explain it is exciting chaos it is um, just students engaged 100% hands-on energy um, constantly um, checking with each other, checking to see if their robot did what it needed to do, working together. Um, it's great for the kids to show off the skills that they've been working on all year. It's a, a great problem solving, um, collaborative effort during the competition. They get to see what other schools are doing, what other teams have developed. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful learning hum that you hear throughout the gym. Very exciting. I, I hope everybody will get to come and see it. Well, we are just excited about uh, inviting educators from all over the state to come to Moore County on May the 4th. At Pinecrest High School, we're going to be doing a student showcase uh, with robotics and programming where people that come can come and see our kids in action actually programming robots, which is really cool to see. And then also on that day, we're going to do professional development on how to do the engineering process in our K-5 classrooms. You'll be able to build, create, destroy, and uh, hopefully at the end of the day, you'll have something to take with you to get started in your own buildings. Describe this as life changing. Oh. Our robotics program, our engineering lessons that we're doing with the kids, we're, we're setting our students up for the greatest success. Yeah. Did you see? Oh. Guess what? They can make a house. I just can't wait to see like how well these students do when they're in high school and then when they go into college or the workforce. You know, just from the starting in kindergarten, third grade. You know, what we've started laying that foundational work for them so far. Can't wait to see how far they can get with this. Okay, so as you can tell, um, the robotics is a definitely a big part of um, what we do in our county. Let me go back to my screen. Here we go. Um, and so you can tell that the EV3 robots especially are a big part. So that's why we were so excited to find out about Coder Z and start using it in our program in our STEM lab. Um, our particular STEM lab, um, our particular school at Robbins, we only have two EV3 robots. We do um, send some teams to the competition, but because we only have two ro robots, it kind of limits the amount of students that can be involved with those teams. So Coder Z really is going to help us um, invite more of our students to learn how to code the robots without having the actual Mindstorms um, to build with. They'll be able to learn how to use the programming and learn how to um, program the robots using Coder Z. And then when they get up to the middle schools where they're a lot more have a lot more access to the robots, you know, they can be a part of the team just as if they'd had the robots the entire time. So we were very, very excited to um, to meet up with the people from Coder Z. And I apologize earlier for kids knocking on the door. We're still in session. And so they were hoping to get into the STEM lab. So um, they're getting ready to pack up and get on the buses right now. But as we move along, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about um, uh, our media and STEM collaboration. Our librarian and I work together um, to include picture books a lot of times with our STEM lessons and teaching the kids about the engineering and design process. So I've included just a couple of those to show you um, some of the things that we did. We, we read a lot of Andrea Beatty's books, Rosie Revere Engineer. In this case, the students um, in K2 were engineering, um, you know, little objects that were on their task cards. 
Um, who sank the boat? This one, I've included the live um, slides. So when you have this um, presentation and you have a chance to look through it, the slides that go with this lesson are embedded as well. And so the students, after reading Who Sank the Boat, had to, of course, come up with a plan for designing a boat um, using those materials. And then we had to drag in a pool and fill it with water and test out the boats and see how many animals they could fit on their boat. Um, we also try to tie our STEM la lessons as well as with literacy component using a picture book most of the time, but also to the curriculum standards that are being taught back in the regular classroom so that our STEM lab is really supporting what is done in the regular classroom. So when our kindergartners were studying their earth science unit um, in the area of weather, um, we, they had to engineer an umbrella and we talked a lot about weather. And then um, to take it to the next level, we wanted to include um, our cart of iPads and let them get used to using iPads. And so we use the portfolio um, app Seesaw. And so the students practice taking pictures of their engineering and adding um, Seesaw elements. So that was a lot of fun for them. Um, our first grade students were studying pushes and pulls and magnets. And so we designed an engineering lesson where they would have to um, you know, use their magnets to move cars and by, by pushing and pulling. And it went along with another book that our librarian had read called Magnet Max. I only have about 40, 40 to 45 minutes for my STEM lessons. And I see my K2 kids one week and then my 3-5 kids another week. So I have to really create short um, bursts of lessons. And because we wanted to include the literacy piece, my librarian sees them the week before I do. So she will read the book to them. And then when they come into the STEM lab, I just review the book and we go from there with the engineering lessons. So we have a nice collaboration there that has been working really well for us. Um, here's one that we did when the kids were studying the sun in second grade. We purchased some solar beads. They had to make some animals out of solar beads and pipe cleaners. And then also engineer with Play-Doh and Popsicle sticks a shelter for those animals to protect them from the sun. And then um, after they built them, we, of course, had to take them outside and see if the solar beads turned color or if their animals were well protected from the sun so that they could learn a little bit more about the sun's energy. Um, we try to also make the lessons relevant to what's going on. For example, this week we've been doing some hurricane-related engineering. Um, last year around Halloween, we wanted our students to learn how to drive the dash robots. So we incorporated that into a book about loving spiders, and we made a big spider web um, out of electrical tape on the STEM floor. And all of the students learned how to drive Dash the robot to collect bugs. And of course, they got to trade in their bugs for a spider ring, because who doesn't love a spider ring? Um, the older kids around that time were going to do an engineering lesson after reading Iggy Peck Architect, another Andrea Beatty book, um, and they were designing pumpkin towers for an architecture unit. So this is a picture of our third, fourth, and fifth graders designing their towers to see how high they could build it um, to hold the little pumpkin. Um, again, robotics starts out early at our school, and so we read books about robots. Um, our younger students made robots just out of um, recycled materials, and you can see pictures of them here. We wanted to take it to the next level and include a little bit of iPad work and app smashing, and so we used the app ChatterPix, which if you're not familiar with it, it takes a picture and record, the students can record their voice and it looks as if the picture has come to life and is talking. So again, this um, particular slide in the presentation is live. So when you look at it later, when you click on the little robots, you'll be able to hear them speaking um, with the kids' voices. Um, we study a lot about cars and motion. And so in second grade, they built um, cars out of just, again, hands-on materials. And then our fifth graders got out the WeDo 2.0, the Lego WeDo 2.0 um, kits, and they built robotic cars and learned to program them and then measured distance. And they also engineered different wheels. How, how would a change in the size of the wheel on the car change the distance that the car would go and how fast it would go? So um, got some robotics in there. Another element of our STEM program that we are really proud of is the walking classroom. And this is um, a program that was started by a North Carolina teacher 
And she has created little, um, they, they're called walkets, but they're pretty much like iPods. And they have 61 STEM lessons on them, on there, that the kids go outside and they walk and they listen to. And it's for, it's especially aimed at our students who really are kind of antsy in their seats. They need another learning style and getting out and walking while they're listening to some science and STEM concepts is very helpful to them. So we have two walking clubs, one in the fourth grade and one in the fifth grade. And we go out and walk once a week with each club. Um, the podcasts are only about 15 or 20 minutes long. So we take a 15 or 20 minute walk. We come back in and we discuss what we've learned. And then um, the students get to vote on which podcast they'd like to listen to next. Sometimes it relates to what we're doing in the class, they're doing in the regular classroom in science. And sometimes it's just a topic that interests them. So that has been a nice addition to get us outside. Um, speaking of getting us outside, because we live in such a very remote rural area, a lot of our students don't realize that there is a larger world beyond our school and our classrooms. So we've really been pushing to go global more with our STEM program. We do a lot with Global Read Aloud, where we um, Skype with authors. We do mystery locations where the kids ask yes and no questions of students from around um, the country and around the world to try to figure out where where each other is. Um, we've done some science collaboration where um, I saw on Twitter a class um, out in the western part of the United States was studying rocks at the same time our fourth graders were studying rocks. So we decided to Skype with them and share some research. Um, we also have been doing some global engineering collaboration. We were lucky enough to get a grant to work with um, a company called Level Up Village and they match us up with um, a third world um, country. Uh, we were matched up, our fourth graders were matched up with um, a group in Zimbabwe, Africa last year, and they collaborated on a project where they were studying the global energy crisis and had to create a solar flashlight. They were able to use the four C's to collaborate with each other. And what they did was they shared weekly videos talking about what they were designing for their solar flashlight. They shared flashlight design files back and forth and edited each other's. They learned about each other's countries, about each other's families, about culture. Um, it was a wonderful experience for our fourth graders while still incorporating STEM. So here they are designing and building with um, 3D modeling software and their solar kits. And then we used a 3D printer that we also got with the grant. And you can see them all standing here with their flashlights that they built. And they also received pictures of the flashlights their partners had built as well. So that was a really fun project to go global. Um, we do a lot with our Dash robots, our Wonder Workshop robots for our younger students. So we start out with pre-kindergartners. We have a pre-K program here as well. And so this is our Dash Robotics Club. We have um, groups of second graders that meet once a week and learn how to program at a, a very basic level, the block programming. Um, and then they actually get to go to a competition as well in May, the same competition that was in the video that you saw. Um, so they get very excited about that and learn programming at an early uh, age. So why did we really want to emphasize and put some emphasis on our girls? Um, well, as I'm sure you have been reading and I have been reading, um, teenage girls often don't feel welcome in STEM classrooms because of the cultural biases and um, um, you know, uh, biases about girls not um, being interested in STEM or not being as good at, at STEM. So we really wanted to break down those biases and really um, show our girls that what's possible for them and also show the rest of the school, sorry, we're releasing for the day, um, show the rest of the school, you know, what girls can do and that girls have very much capability, but better, as good of capabilities as boys. Um, Girls often don't see a connection between what they're learning in the classroom to the careers they want to pursue, especially our girls who come um, from a very rural area. They don't know what they don't know. They don't realize what careers are available for them and what opportunities are available for them. And so we wanted to make sure that we introduce them to those ideas and get them started early on that. Um, and of course, they don't have um, very good role models for STEM careers, um, like for engineering and computer programming. So those, those were really the main points that we wanted to emphasize when we started our girls um, program, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. Um, a, a really nice article that I read by the Huffing, that was in the Huffington Post, had five ways to address 
um, the issues for helping girls um, in STEM. One was to start young, and we believe that's true for all of our children here at Robbins. We start in preschool. Um, so starting out all of the students, but especially girls thinking about STEM careers and thinking about engineering and robotics and programming at a young age. Um, acknowledging struggle. A lot of our girls, actually, you'll see in a few minutes, are very into struggle. They they feel challenged and they're very motivated by struggle. And so that has been really interesting to see and, and we still wanna continue to uh, um, address that and throw struggles out to them so that they can learn how to deal with um, you know, perseverance. Um, watching what they watch, um, making sure that when we see advertising and the bias that's in the media, that we have conversations with our girls that um, you know, even though this, this commercial or most of these commercials show boys using the robotics. Girls are also learning robotics and can learn robotics just as well. Um, promoting multidimensional interests. A lot of our girls think um, or have the understanding through so social and cultural bias again that if you're into cheerleading you can't also be into robotics. Um, so just getting the message across to our girls that all human beings and especially girls are multidimensional. We we can like different things and still be you know a successful person and pursue things um, that may be different than other people. And then of course providing good role models for our students, which is something that we did address with our um, Giga Girls program. So let me tell you about our Giga Girls After School Coding Club. The girls um, submitted applications. We opened it up to our third, fourth, and fifth grade girls. Over 50 applications were received, and in a school at the size of ours, a small school, we were very impressed by that. We wanted to start off small last year, and so we selected 12 girls from the applications, um, and I've linked the application here if you'd like to take a look at it later. We met every Tuesday for an hour after school, and um, to address some of the things that I just spoke about, we decided that um, we would match our girls up with mentor um, com computer science female majors at local universities. So all of our 12 girls were matched up with a mentor from NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, and Stanford University. And so they each had another um, female computer science major at the graduate and undergraduate level um, matched up with them and they, um, communicated back and forth through blogs. We decided to include blogging in our club because we wanted our girls, first of all, to write about what they were learning in the club, um, write about the programming and write about the robotics like Coder Z that they were learning um, and be able to document that and improve their literacy, but also to be able to communicate with the outside world especially their mentors at the university level. And of course we had to have cookies and juice because girls love cookies and juice like every kid loves cookies and juice. Um, so during the first year, we wanted to just kind of explore lots of different things with coding. So we started off with just doing some pixel art. Um, the girls really enjoyed expressing themselves. And I've just screenshotted some of their blog posts throughout the next few slides so that you can see how they felt about what we were doing. So here are some of the things they created. Um, then we moved into Google CS first, some of their courseware, and we um, were learning how to do Scratch early on. And so I loved this response from Anam, who was Caden's mentor. Anam is a, um, a computer science major at NC State University. And I just thought it was so neat that after Caden had told her about learning Scratch, she commented back that I'm making a scratch game too for one of my classes. It's about penguins in pajamas who go from planet to planet defeating evil cake monsters. My group members and I got a bit crazy with the idea, haha. -ha. Just the fact that Anam, who is at the graduate level, is doing the same kind of coding that Caden was doing, just made Caden's eyes light up. She just, um, that connection that, wow, somebody in who's a girl in college is doing the same thing I'm doing. I think it just shows them a nice pathway um, if they're interested in this type of career in the future that yes, girls can do this. And yes, girls are doing it around the world. Um, we did some coding with Groundhog Day, again, trying to make things relevant for what was going on. I love um, Madison's quote at the bottom here. Every time I come to Giga Girls, we do something new and exciting. The girls were very excited about coming to the club. They hardly ever missed the club. Um, they were very motivated. Another um, site that we used was Code Combat. This was just a really nice one to teach the girls some Python coding, just to get them um, to see a little bit different coding than what we had been using um, with the uh, Scratch and the more block programming. 
Um, we also, anytime anything new came out, like the Merge Cubes, when they first came out, I ran to Walmart and bought all that I could. And the girls tested those out for us, so they enjoyed doing that. And then came along one of our favorites, Coder Z. We found out about Coder Z, and again, because it ties so well with our EV3 robots that the students um, are using in our computer, in our, in our robotics clubs at the competitions, this was a perfect fit for us, and the girls jumped right on it. And um, Jimena, and her picture is there on the right-hand side of your screen, um, said, I had the most coolest day of my life. She was in fifth grade last year. She said, I finally got past level 10. And I think as you'll see on the next couple slides, the thing that the girls really loved about Coder Z was that first of all, they realized um, it was gonna help them code the robots that they weren't able to code because they weren't in our robotics club. So it gave them an opportunity, even though they didn't have the actual robots in our lab, they could um, learn how to program them on the computer. But they loved the challenge that Coder Z provides. Um, this is uh, Rachel, and she was in third grade last year. And I was a little nervous about having third, third grade students use Coder Z because I wasn't sure if it would be too challenging but we threw it out to them and they just picked up right, right where they needed to. They, they accepted the challenge. And as you can see, Rachel said I had fun coding the robot. It was a bit hard, but I passed some levels. I loved coding the robot. They loved the challenge. They loved trying to get to the next level. Um, this is a quote from Yori. She was also a third grader. Um, and of course she talks about how level eight was super hard and I liked it. They liked the challenge. So I think a lot of times people fear throwing too much challenge on our children, but um, they really want that challenge, and especially this group of girls. Um, Stacy at the bottom, the reason I included this quote, um, at the end she says, the hardest part was when I had to do the turn and get it into the parking lot. Mission 14 said it had to do something with perpendicular. Well, when she went back to her classroom and told her regular classroom teacher how she had been learning to code a robot to get into a parking lot so that she was perpendicular, her teacher was overjoyed because they had been learning about perpendicular lines and all different kinds of lines in their regular math class. So it just, the connection was really nice and um, to have her bring that um, new skill back to her regular classroom just really proves um, what a good job this, this club is doing to help our students prepare for lots of things, not only our robotics competition. Um, and here again is a conversation between Caden and Anam, where they're talking about um, working out the bugs and Anam is just so nice to Caden telling her, the more you code, the more you'll learn to um, figure out what those bugs are and avoid them. So that mentorship really meant a lot to our girls and was very helpful as they moved through. Um, near the end of the year, we did get to Skype with our some of the mentors. You can see their picture there, all crowded around um, the image of our girls. That was a special day. They got to learn a little bit more about their engineering program at the state at the graduate level. Um, and this year, we are hoping to actually take the girls on a road trip on a bus up to NC State and visit. Um, the engineering department and, and hear from the girls face to face and take a tour and go into um, their computer science classes so the girls can actually see this is a possibility for me. This is somewhere that I can go in the future if I'm interested. And then on the right hand side, um, we had a party at the end and all of their mentors had sent them individual little gift bags from the computer science department full of all kinds of computer science fun geeky things and um, handwritten notes from each of their mentors so that meant a lot to our girls so where are these girls going to go from here well the fifth graders that have now have moved on to our middle school which is a totally different school um, a little bit across town is Elise Middle School and we are really excited that they're going to continue gig girls over there with my friend Carrie who I talked about earlier. Um, she is um, going to start the club up over there and they'll be able to continue with their mentors and hopefully pick up some more giga girls um, that are at the middle school level. They will also have the opportunity to actually join the Mindstorm EV3 teams over there and they'll be prepared because of Coder Z. They will know how to program the EV3 robots without ever having put their hands on the robots themselves. And then we also have the first tech challenge teams at the middle school level. The feeder school that they go into for high school, Northmore High School, they have awesome opportunities there because they have the same emphasis on getting more girls involved. As a matter of fact, last year, 75% of their robotics team members were girls and all they had an all girls cyber patriot team. Um, so our girls are on a wonderful path um, to continue what they're learning, what they've learned here at Robbins. 
One more thing I wanted to tell you very quickly about for the Giga Girls um, is that we they also did a low level up village course in which they were connected with um, a school in Mexico and they were working on a bro global programming course where they were learning scratch to learning to design a scratch video game along with their partners in the Mexican school. And so here they are. Um, they would come in on their spare time into the STEM lab, the girls would, and they would get into their accounts and they would see what their partners had done in Mexico. They would record videos, um, their weekly videos, just like the fourth grade class had done earlier in the year, um, where they got to know their partners in Mexico, what they were studying, a lot about the culture, um, as well as how to better design the scratch game together. So they were designing a race car game in scratch. Um, and then in the bottom pictures, you can see that we were able to Skype with our partners in Mexico and they got to meet them face to face and talk about the experience and talk about their schools and their culture and about engineering and robotics and programming. So that was a really fun experience for our girls as well. I wanted to include a slide right here at the end. Um, just it, when you have these slides in front of you, if you click on the thank you picture, it will take you out to the grants that we've received if you need to get some ideas on how you can get grants for your STEM labs or for other programs you're running. Um, I've included just some articles that I found really helpful as we were researching how best to meet the needs of our girls here at Robbins. Um, and I think that's about it. So I am very excited that I got to share with you what we're doing here and um, hope it was helpful to the programs that you're working on at your schools. Thank you, Kim. This was super fascinating. I really enjoyed it. Um, we're going to open the you know, floor up for questions. Now the audience can send us questions. I'll read them out loud and you can answer them. Okay. Uh, we're waiting for the audience to send in their questions. I'm going to throw up a few polls for the audience to uh, answer. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity to let people know that CoderZ is available for purchase. Um, so the first poll that I'm going to put up here for the audience to take a look at is, um, would you like one of our team members to be in touch with you regarding CoderZ? So um, just take a second now to, to answer the poll and um, we'll move on to the next one. And then the second question I just quickly want to get in there before we get to the audience questions is we want to get a sense of who are our audience, what are their, what are your roles? So um, teacher, principal, superintendent, STEM coordinator. Okay, a lot of teachers and a lot of STEM coordinators. Okay. Okay, so let's see uh, what questions are sent in. Uh, the first question um, is from Gabriella. And the question is, do you think all students should be encouraged to learn STEM? Absolutely, yes. I think all students should be encouraged to learn STEM. As a matter of fact, we think it is so important here. Like I said, we've started at our preschool level. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely important to start them at an early age, especially those students um, that may not have experiences or have opportunities to um, have experiences at home or in their small communities where, they're, um, where they have access to STEM materials um, and to learn about STEM careers and the opportunities that are available to them. Yes, all of our boys and girls starting at the pre-K level here um, are experiencing STEM this year. There are also two other elementary schools in our county who have um, put money into um, having a dedicated full-time STEM lab um, where the students come through. It's at all of our, at our three schools that have the STEM lab, it's yeah, one of the kids, excuse me one second, I'm sorry. Sorry, <laughs> part of the day in the life at school. Um, all three of our schools that have dedicated STEM labs, it's, part, it's one of the specials that the kids go to. So it's in the rotation of like 
um, gym and art and music. Now STEM is one of the specials um, that they all get to come to. So absolutely, I think it's important for every child. That's fantastic. Um, I just want to quickly remind people, in case you forgot from the beginning of the webinar, to ask a question, use the GoToWebinar uh, chat or question panel, uh, and then we'll see that and we'll read that out loud. Um, so the next question we have is from John. And this is, how should we measure students' progress in STEM? Uh, competency, knowledge, desire to continue? I think that's such a good question. And I think it's something that um, I think is the hardest for me. I do a lot of formative assessment in that I'm constantly, you know, walking around and watching what the students are engineering. Um, and we've seen as time goes on that when we continue to teach the engineering process and programming process, um, that it becomes easier and easier for the students because they're able to carry out engineering jobs, um, you know, at a much higher level. And I think um, you can just see through that formative assessment um, what they're, how much they're learning each time they do a new engineering project. Uh, we also like to document it, like I said, with um, a portfolio system. We happen to use Seesaw because it's free um, and it's an app on all of our Chromebooks and our iPads. And so we have our students document a lot of what they're doing in the STEM lab using Seesaw so that we can kind of look back at their portfolio and see how much they've grown. We also do a lot of surveying with our students. Um, so we will we'll survey the students like at every quarter and ask, um, you know, which projects seemed the most challenging, which projects did you enjoy the most, what do you think you've learned in the STEM lab? Um, so I think a lot of formative assessment um, and a lot of um, asking the students, what are you learning? What, what do you still feel it is most challenging? And blogging, as you saw with the Gig Girls, blogging was a great formative assessment as well. Um, and you can do that through Seesaw. We happen to use KidBlog, um, but I was able to read through their blog posts and see, you know, what what was what they were struggling with and what they were feeling more and more comfortable with. But that's a really good question. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we have a question from Jen. Can you share any resources like case studies that show the benefits of starting STEM early? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do have several um, case studies that, that helped us when we were researching, including our preschool program in, into it. Um, we've also just written a very large grant that we're waiting to hear back from that would um, allow us to start a summer STEM camp just for our little students, for um, our rising kindergarten and first grade students. Um, and so we, we had done a lot of research with that, and I will be glad to, um, I can send those resources out if, if I get your contact information, I'd be glad to. Yeah, definitely. What we'll do afterwards is we'll, I see you have your email right there on the slide, but we'll also include that information um, in our follow-up. So Great. another question from Sandy. I am hosting summer camps but want to be able to travel to share what happens at our STEM camps? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but maybe maybe you understand it? No, but I'm excited you're having summer STEM camps. That's really, really exciting. Cool, cool. Okay, um, another question from Jen. Do you have a STEM coordinator on site? If so, is this person full time? Uh, no, I would. I guess I would be considered the STEM coordinator. Um, I am full time. Um, we have we have a team of digital integration facilitators in our county. There is about twelve or thirteen of us that are at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. And what our jobs are as um, digital integration facilitators is um, going into the schools and into teachers' classrooms and collaborating on lessons that integrate technology. Um, and so that, I am part of that team, and so that has been really helpful. Um, we do have a county director that's in charge of that area. Um, and because our emphasis in our district is so much on STEM and robotics, there is a lot of support at the district level from our superintendent through a, a lot of the directors and principals um, to continue um, to build our STEM program. But at the three elementary schools that I talked about where STEM is a full-time position, um, we were classroom teachers. Um, and we have just taken on the role of a, a full-time STEM lab teacher. Great. Um, we have a question here from Andrea. 
what's the simplest robotics program to start with K through second grade students and for third and fifth through fifth grade students? That is a really good question. Um, if you're talking about uh, hands-on, by far um, we have found the little bee bots, and I think I have a picture of them on one of the first slides that I showed you. Um, they are little robots that um, are standalone. In other words, you just turn them on on the bottom and then the kids program them by pushing the arrows on the top of the bee. And we have used these with our preschoolers, kindergarten, actually all the way up through, but they're really good with preschool through second grade. Um, to kind of teach the linear um, way of programming so that, you know, every time they push an arrow on the top, the B remembers their, their code, their program. And then when they push the go button, it runs that complete program. And so we use that to kind of introduce our students to the robotics. But we've also used um, the Wonder Workshop Dash robots uh, with very young students. Our pre-kindergarten and kindergarten students have also learned to um, not only drive Dash, but also block code program Dash through the Wonder Workshop apps. And then, um, and then of course, we have um, the Lego We Do Build kits, and we use those with students. I've used those with students as low as first grade to learn how to build the small robots and program, start to learn to program them as well. Um, our EV3s, um, we start with our uh, fourth graders, but I'm, sh but I'm, you know, I'm sure third graders could learn to program EV3s, and especially with Coder Z, obviously third graders can. My Giga Girls, a lot of them were in third grade, um, and so those would be the ones I would suggest for the younger students. Great, great information. Um, uh, we have a question from Kathy. What are your favorite or most useful apps for iPad? Favorite apps for iPad? Right. Okay, well definitely Seesaw, that's a favorite. Um, we like Chatterpix, um, we like Padlet, we like um, anything where the students are creating rather than just consuming. Um, I know there's a lot of game-like apps on the iPads, and to be quite honest with you, we don't have any of those on our iPads in the STEM lab. All of our apps are creation apps. And again, if you'll email me, I can send you a list of the ones that we use quite a bit, if that would be helpful. Great. Um, we'll definitely put you guys in touch. And then we have, we're, we have enough time, I think, for two more questions. Um, so we have a question from Janice. Do you teach three separate lessons to each grade, at one to third grade, another to fourth, et cetera, or do you group one lesson and teach it to those grades? That's a really good question. Um, I've done both. Um, sometimes when I'm looking at, we have a common planning document that we use with our staff, and so I get to see what they're planning for the coming weeks. And so sometimes when I see that, um, like my third, my fourth, and my fifth grade are all going to be teaching something different in science that um, I really could develop a good lesson for, then I will have three different things going on in the lab that week. Um, and other times, um, like when the hurricane came, I decided we were just going to use our Sphero robots and do um, a hurricane-related activity that kind of met the needs of all third, fourth, and fifth graders. So this week, they're kind of all doing the same project where they're doing a hurricane debris removal where they have to engineer a structure to attach to the Sphero to collect debris that's on the floor and get it back to their team. Um, and so that kind of met the needs of all, all three of the grade levels. And so um, it just depends. It depends on what they're studying in their regular classroom, and it also depends on um, kind of what's going on in the world to be relevant. So I've done both. Great. Um, so the final question, it's a long one. How do you feel when you know you're actually closing the gender gap in STEM education? What can each of us do in our own schools and districts to create a real change? Any tips? Wow, that is a powerful question. Um, I think what you decide to do in your own school is going to be unique to your population of students. Um, our after school girls club has made a significant difference um, in our school culture and in the growth of the girls. Um, having the mentors, um, kind of just meeting all those needs that were on that one slide, starting early, um, having role models that they actually connect with, real life role models, not just somebody that they've seen in a movie or seen on TV or will never meet. Um, but having girls that are studying what they want to study in college um, has made a huge difference. 
Um, so I think just being purposeful, looking at the research and seeing what's suggested and then picking a piece or two of that and starting something um, new that maybe isn't being done at your school yet. Um, because we didn't have any after school clubs. We didn't you know, have anything for just our girls. And um, it has definitely been a popular thing. We're hoping to increase the amount of girls this year that will be in the club um, and just continue it. And, and as well, it's, you know, it's, it's created a fire across the county as well. You know, our middle school is now going to be incorporating Giga Girls. And we have some other um, schools in the county who, when they heard about our project, decided to start a girls club as well. Um, some of them are robotics girls, girls robotics clubs. Some of them are just engineering clubs. Um, so, you know, just start with something you're passionate about and, and try it. Give it a try and see how it goes. Wow. It's really amazing that something started off that small can grow. And um, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Like I said before, I, I really enjoyed it. And I think our audience probably did as well. Thank you so much. I was really glad to share. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. So um, to continue this great conversation, I recommend joining our robotics and STEM for all Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash STEM for all, the number four, all. Uh, we'll also send a follow-up email, as I mentioned, with a link to the recording and the slides and details how to follow up with Kim. As I mentioned before, Coder Z is available for purchase. You can contact us through, you can contact us through our website at gocoderz.com for a quote or sign up for our free trial. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today and for your great participation. Uh, if you have any questions, please be in touch or post on the STEM for All Facebook group. And uh, have a great day.